Hey, it's Dave the Clone back again. You better check it, correct it. So, let's begin. And your favorite movie chatter upper water cooler discussion guy on another episode of 15 Minutes of Movie Memory Madness brought to you by the Hollow Nine Network. So if you're hearing the sound of my voice right now, I know you've already smashed the subscribe and like and the bell icon and whatever else they've added to let the algorithm know you like being here because this is the place where you start to go, oh, holy crap, yeah, I remember that movie. Like, I remember when all of a sudden the world was like a rage getting ready for yet another found footage type movie. Uh, except in this one, we get to see the head of the Statue of Liberty get ripped off and thrown down the street. I'm talking about the real deal, Cloverfield from 2008. Uh, man, what a mind trip going back on this one is. I actually, just this past weekend, got to introduce this movie to one of my nine-year-old twin nephews, uh, as well as their 19-year-old au pair from Italy. Uh, neither of whom had ever seen the movie before, um, or were even aware of the movie before. <laughs> and and it's interesting to see the different reactions to the movie from both of those folks, but myself included, because like most of the films we talk about on this podcast, it's not just about the movie itself, it's about literally transporting back in time to when... This was, uh, you know, brand new when it was when it was just kind of hitting the social zeitgeist consciousness airwaves all together from nothing to, and I, I, you know, this movie <laughs> from producer J.J. Abrams, the beginning and quite possibly the peak of the Abrams Renaissance. Um, he's sort of faded, I think, from. Uh, from popular culture a bit these days, but this was also the height. This was like four years down the road from the premiere of Lost. So at that time, when Lost was still, you know, in the middle of uh, existing and, and, you know, even though it was only six seasons, it took, I think, a little over, well, I guess it took around six years. I think it was 2011, 2012, something, something like that when it finally concluded. But during the whole time that it was still on anything that abrams did you assumed there was some kind of connection to lost and it seemed like lost was the way he uh, established the style for anything that would be produced by his company bad robot and um this this movie was no exception this movie was uh written by drew goddard and directed by Matt Reeves. <laughs> Matt Reeves, who has recently done the Rob Pattinson Batman movie. And um, I think Drew Goddard, I kind of, I want to say, I read somewhere that he is going to be working on the fifth Matrix movie, which was just announced today, the day that I'm recording this, uh, that Warner Brothers is in the works of putting together. But at this time, everybody was still new. It was the beginning of their um, sort of uh, coming together as creative forces, and they were both alums of Lost. They both had uh, worked on Lost as uh, both writers and directors of episodes, so it felt like it made sense for us to expect some kind of Lost. This was also, I think, before we got any sense of really, besides just seeing the smoke monster on Lost, anytime there was something that was about a big creature we assumed oh is this like the origin story of the smoke monster um in fact this movie uh connects in my mind to another bad robot movie which was super eight uh, and there's a moment in that movie where the creature in that film kind of sneaks up behind the characters and you see it in the reflection of a puddle on the ground and it kind of combined the smoke monster from Lost and the monster from Cloverfield into one thing at the same time just because of the sort of little behavior of it and the look of it um, you almost get the sense that the creature from Super 8 might be from possibly the origin planet of the Cloverfield creature but the Cloverfield monster ultimately this movie uh, and I'm glad we've already covered the Blair Witch 1 and 2 on this podcast series because this is yet another found footage film. Um, 
very much taking the, you know, playing in the sandbox that the Blair Watch Project built and also combining a classic Hollywood staple, the kaiju, the giant monster attacking a city. In fact, Abrams went on the record when this movie came out and saying that this was his, he wanted to do sort of his take on a Godzilla movie. He wanted to do his type of Godzilla. In fact, I think it was after going on a trip to Japan with his kids and seeing like the Godzilla toys in the store, he was kind of like, oh, I want to do a giant monster that attacks the city. Now, much like uh, even another found footage franchise, oof, found footage franchise, look at that. I am speaking in alliteration. Let's see if I can continue it without including any alienation. In fact, it's all part of the alleviation of the agitation you might be feeling from life in general. And <laughs> I don't know, that was just, I, that was fun. I was glad I was able to do that just now. In any case, um, much like uh, Paranormal Activity, a lot of the universe, the Cloverfield world that was, that became, because uh, there are, there eventually were two more films in the, set in what became the Cloverfield Trilogy. Um, this one, being the first, didn't do much to establish in the movie proper, in the movie itself. You know, you could just watch this movie and it could be a one-off Monster Attacks New York. Um, done in 2008, still a little close to the epic national horror that was 9-11. In fact, I think there's even a line in the movie at the beginning of the sort of... Um, you know, tragedy, the beginning of the giant creature, which we didn't at first in the be in the movie, you don't know is a giant creature, you just know that there's like sort of a big rumble, the power goes out for a few minutes, there there's reports on the news of a possible earthquake and an oil tanker sinking off the coast of uh I think in off the coast of Ellis Island <laughs> in the harbor there next to New York City. And then while they're up on the roof trying to see what they can see, a giant explosion happens and you hear somebody go, is it another attack? Um, definitely it was a weird time to be starting to kind of um, wander into this territory of like, oh, let's talk about New York getting, a, you know, a, a, having some kind of a major, you know, event happening there. Um... I'm trying to think of where to where to go first because uh, the movie also stars uh, T.J. Miller <laughs> as HUD, which any video game player knows HUD is also a heads-up display. He's the camera operator, so it's it is truly a found footage movie. The very first thing you see, the first graphic up on the screen, is that this tape is property of the Department of Defense and is evidence from the incident, quote unquote, Cloverfield. Um, which also, ironically, the name Cloverfield stuck. It was really just the code name that was given to the movie while it was under production. Um, and I think there's even, and it was chosen because uh, if you're driving on the, on the 405 in California on the way into Hollywood, there is an exit for Cloverfield Avenue. And it was a street, it was, a, uh, it was an exit that J.J. Abrams would pass quite often on his way into work. And so when they needed to, because at that time he was, you know, lost era. J.J. Abrams a couple years in, everybody's like completely glued to the mystery of will they ever get off the friggin' island? How, you know, what's what's all the shit going on on and on? What are, what's in the hatches? I think we even got at the very beginning of this movie after you see the Department of Defense, you know, um, and color bars at the beginning. There's a quick flash of the pearl icon for anybody who watched Lost, the Pearl Hatch. So it does feel, you know, Hanzo Foundation, it does feel like it is tangentially connected to the Lost universe. Um, and how to explain how you would have known, I mean, I was one of those people who was constantly, while I was at work, in between, you know, weeks while Lost was in season, would be not only talking to any and everybody I could about it, either at lunch or on the water cooler, randomly seeing them in the hallway, whatever. We would also be like at our desks. We, I'm saying we, like there was a whole team of us. It was mostly me, but one of my coworkers was into it as much as I was as well. But we would always be just kind of looking up online, checking for um, 
whatever news stories there were, whatever was making its way to the social webs about either Lost or projects that the Lost producers had going on. And one of the things they had done with Lost were these sort of ARGs, alternate reality games, where you would kind of get to go a little further, and it would almost be bringing the world of the show into the real world. Like, the Hanzo Foundation, which was a major component of Lost, had its own website that if you clicked on the different links for the different sort of areas of study, you would wind up getting clues and little hints about things that were going on on the show. Well, very much the same with Cloverfield. There is so much more about the sort of potential origins of the monster or what actually triggered the monster's attack of the city that you only got if you went onto the various websites. You know, and I, I watched a YouTube video. I can't even remember whose it was, but while I was getting ready for this, and they made all the connections, and I was just like, wow, you know, talk about having time on your hands, people. But um, as I'm watching the movie in the background now, the biggest thing that was supposed to kind of lead you down the rabbit hole of looking things up is the whole kind of uh, sort of base level of what the story is. The story is uh, we are seeing the going away party for our main character, Rob, who's played by Michael Stahl David. And uh, his brother is played by Mike Vogel. And he, Rob, is leaving New York. He's actually going to be going to Japan. He's just recently gotten this incredible job as vice president of a company that makes a soft drink called Slusho. And you see his brother, uh, Jason, played by Mike Vogel, is wearing a Slusho t shirt. Now, in the Abrams verse, Slusho has existed in shows all the way going back to Alias. It is also seen in um, being sold at the gas station that the main character stops at in the next movie, 10 Cloverfield Lane, which happens to be the same gas station as in the Super 8 movie, and I think they sell Slusho in that movie as well. It also pops up in Fringe, which I think was also tangentially connected to the uh, Lost Universe because in one of the episodes of that show, a, one of the clues they find in one of the murder scenes is some Ocean, Oceanic Airlines tickets. So, you know, in my mind, this goes back to this thing I've, I've often talked about how, like, all before we had cinematic universes, like before Marvel really did that, um, there was this sense I had because movies would always make these sort of in joke references to each other, even if they weren't made by the same producers, let you know that, like, uh, one of my professors in college says stuff like this is to also kind of remind you that you're watching a movie because, you know, movies are one of the art forms that are most, um, most realistically mimicking real life and our imaginations could get lost in that. And so, uh, when you're in, in the old movies, like in Westerns, when you would see the two wagon wheels of a wagon going across the screen, it was supposed to remind you of the film reels that were projecting the movie onto the wall. Or if you see two, um, if you see someone actually pick up a video camera or uh, engage a reel-to-reel -reel audio recording uh, apparatus, that was also supposed to remind you of the fact that you're watching a movie. So um, I think, I don't even know where I was going with this, <laughs> it was supposed to be that like the fact that they would make all these little in-references to each other to also let you know, it's reminding you that you're watching a movie and that you know that because oh this connects to another movie then it could just be a movie that the filmmaker liked and wanted to make reference to but in any case i digress from that weird tangent to go back to the fact that yes at least the abrams verse of bad robot had a lot of these little easter eggs that would tie it together now slusho itself is a soft drink created by this uh, a company that is a subsidiary of another Japanese company called Tagaratu. And Tagaratu, you don't really get a lot of attention to it in the movie, but it is when they show on the news um, Liberty Island in flames because an oil tanker has been sort of capsized next to it and it exploded. Everybody thinks that's what kind of kicked off the big explosion we see in this movie during the beginning of the of the attack. I mean, before the movie, before the attack starts, it's like we've got probably 15 minutes of just sort of like found footage of a party we didn't get to go to, but you also get a little bit, so the very first thing we see on the tape 
that was part of this that is that is this def- Department of Defense evidence is um, two people in a high-rise apartment overlooking Central Park, and it's the guy they're walking he's walking around telling you that you know he's in his girlfriend's dad's place, he's out of town, so they got to use the place for the weekend. And they clearly have slept together, and this, this is, and they're planning on just spending the day going around. They're going to go to Coney Island. They're going to just spend the day together. It's young love blossoming, young love. Um, and then the next thing that's happening is a month later. Like the tape, obviously, whoever is using the camera didn't check to see if there was a tape already in there. Just picked it up and started recording with it. And we're recording the going away party. You start to kind of put some of these pieces together, and I had a fun time trying to explain to both my nephew and the au pair like they're like well who are these people and what's going on because rob the guy who's going away uh shows up to the surprise party by himself and not long after the girl beth who is the girl we saw him spending the day with at the beginning of the tape shows up and she's with another guy and so there's this like you know soap opera ishy drama about the fact that rob and beth have known each other since college. Rob's been in love with Beth since college, and the first time they actually slept together was that day we see at the beginning of the tape, and we only get that through his brother talking to HUD, who has the camera, and his girlfriend, Lily, played by uh, Jessica Lucas. And um, and it's funny because there's this whole like five minutes where like HUD is going around to everybody else at the party who's all their mutual friends and goes like, oh, yo, yo, did you hear Rob and Beth had sex? Rob and Beth totally slept together and they're all like, I knew something was going on. And I don't know, I think maybe because of my affinity for Michael Mann and even Tarantino, like movies where you just have to kind of pay attention to the dialogue. In fact, I also, I often wonder this about when people say, oh yeah, I didn't really get what was going on in that movie, I'm like, well, let's ask a few questions here. Do you know how to listen? Do you know how to hear what people are saying and make the connections? Because I guess there are people who don't. And I'm surprised by that, you know? Especially now, well, now it's less surprising because now we're in the era of, yeah, I may be watching a movie, but I'm probably also scrolling on my phone because I have to keep connected to the world at large of social media because, God forbid, I live my life for five minutes not knowing what someone else's status says. Um, And from that, I digress a little bit. But um, in general, I've often been surprised before the era of everyone being attached to a device that there were like people who just couldn't pick up on these these moments and and so this was it, it was very big at game of thrones i think this was one of the things that like on mondays after a new episode of game of thrones my former boss slash manager would always be like all right you gotta tell me what was going on and i'm like all right look dude come on you need to be able to watch some of these scenes and pick up the dialogue you know now not i know not everybody is gonna go on the internet and play the alternate reality game and find out about tagaratu and the slush show but like at the very least put together what people are talking about at the party uh, in any case the drama can, the drama ensues when she shows up with this other guy and she winds up leaving the party early she's leaving with the other guy they have this sort of moment where it's not very nice these two characters are clearly are into each other they're not having a great moment and he's about to leave the next day for japan so it's kind of going to be over for him and he doesn't get much time to sulk about this before all of a sudden there's a rumble, the lights go out, they come back on, the news reporter's saying that there is not only an earthquake, or could have been an earthquake that caused the tanker to overturn and explode, but as they're like, oh, let's go up on the roof and see what we can see, a huge explosion happens, like, several, like, across the city, but it's, like, big, and it throws enough shrapnel in the air that they wind up having to run back in, and it's almost like missiles are hitting the city. It becomes chaos instantly. It goes from, like, stupid soap opera drama to chaos. And this is all being captured by a guy who's just walking around with a camera. Very much something I used to do in college. Again, in the days before, we just had um, camera phones, and, and everybody was recording everything. You know, you used to actually have an, a camera. You used to need to have an actual device designed for this. Um, and the big complaint that my nephew had, and even I had, when I, which I remember from seeing this in the movies, is that 
You know, at least in Godzilla, you saw Godzilla a lot. You saw the monster. You knew what it looked like. One of the things that this movie has in common and very sort of um, typical, again, of J.J. Abrams, of, uh, of his style of um, cliffhanger-ish storytelling is... We, for the most part throughout the majority of the movie, only see the creature in little glimpses, little quick, like it's walking in, in between buildings. Again, again, because we're seeing this all through um, uh, the, the perspective of people actually on the ground running from this thing. Um, there's even like some parts where like buildings collapse it looks very reminiscent again of 9-11 and the the cloud of uh dust i think we see i'm watching just now the, the chrysler building collapses i think that's also a little a bit of a nod to the 1998 godzilla film with matthew broderick where in that movie as the creature is kind of making his way through the city um, I think one of his advisors goes, yeah, we're going to lose a few buildings. And the mayor's like, okay, this isn't just a few buildings. This is the Chrysler building for Christ's sake. This is, this is like a landmark. Um, and so, you know, it's supposed to really capture that if this was going, I guess, you know, hyper-realistic, if this was going on, you wouldn't just suddenly get like the monster standing in the middle of the street in front of you. It probably would be this kind of like you don't really know what's happening and and you're hearing rumors the military is not responding cops aren't telling you what's going on um but again it's a movie and when you go see a movie about what you know is a monster attacking the city you want to see the monster the few times we do see it though are pretty impressive it, it, they went out of their way to design a very strange looking monster um one of the things you do have to contend with even worse than um, than it ha occurred with the Blair Witch is this sort of shaky cam. And I know my nephew hated this. He was just like, oh, the camera's shaking too much. This is crazy. Um, and it's it, it, I, I don't often have this happen, but I remember sitting in the theater and at the beginning of the movie, uh, the first shot where they're in the apartment is, is very kind of slow and steady. But then the first person to be operating the camera is Jason, the Mike Vogel character, and that's like full on like filming shoes, like 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 whipping around the camera really fast. And um, I I remember sitting in the theater and I had to turn to my girlfriend at the time and say, I yeah, <laughs> this needs to steady up a bit soon, otherwise I'm gonna throw up. And that didn't happen to me in Blair Witch, but I know it was definitely happening to the people that I was seeing Blair Witch with. And so I thought that's one of the things that will always stay with me about my experience seeing this in the theater was like, yeah, for about five minutes, I thought I was going to have to leave. I thought, I was, but then there was a part of me that was like, no, man, we're going to learn stuff about Lost in this movie. I got to stay. I got to stay. Even if I puke, I'll stay. And then once HUD takes the camera and actually what they wound up doing was it, it was being filmed by an actual camera guy uh there are moments where suddenly hud is in front of the camera and um if you were watching any of the behind the scenes you kind of see how they did all that but he still was there and voiceovering and um i think a lot it's not like all of his lines were adr which is added after the fact but um he he was definitely not operating the camera for the whole time I found a lot of the imagery I found to create the visuals for the YouTube video on this one. Um, <laughs> in fact, we're clearly uh, not behind the scenes, but production stills where you kind of would see HUD carrying the camera. And it wasn't even the same kind of camera that it was supposed to be in the beginning of the film. But it was like, I'm looking at these pictures going, this is not what we see in the movie. In the movie, it's all from HUD's perspective. So it was interesting that those pictures are floating around. A lot of them are on imdb you could can't like, uh, you know look up the movie and take a look at the photos and you'll see what i'm talking about um yeah wow that was a lot <laughs> um and uh in any case so now once the chaos begins it's like a total uh, very reminiscent again 9 11 the people are kind of all moving in a huge group uh you, you're coming upon people who are injured uh, but there are several times throughout their sort of adventure that we we are kind of like 
I <laughs> caught in the middle like the monsters at the end of the block. You turn to run one way, run away, and the, the army is coming up the other side of the block behind you. In fact, that's one of the first times you really get a good glimpse of the monster is when the military's fight is, you know, shooting missiles at it and stuff, and it's, like, right there, and it finally, like, leans its head down, and you're like, whoa, that's not the smoke monster. So they definitely um, created this kind of creature. And when you read up on the websites, when you do the alternate reality game, I mean, they do try to get across the Brooklyn Bridge. Mike Vogel buys it on the bridge. A, a giant tentacle comes up and takes the bridge out. So, like, you know that this thing's got a lot of elements of monster design going on. Um, but what, we, what we're dealing with is a creature that had been sort of in hibernation uh, on the bottom of the ocean. And this company, Tagaratu, which um, not only created the, the company that makes the slusho drink, uh, it, cre it, it was known for um, deep sea oil uh, drilling. And on the alternate reality game, there is footage of a, um, an oil rig being taken down like it, on the news it said collapse but when you see the footage a, a tentacle clearly comes up out of the water wraps around the main deck of the oil rig and pulls it underwater and then they even cut to on the alternate reality game there's footage of um, sort of the Japanese Coast Guard trying to get to people in the water around where the um, around where the oil rig was and like pieces of it are being spit up out of the water and uh, the slusho drink itself is made from this um, this uh, seabed nectar, which is like a, an herb that grows in the deepest, coldest part of the ocean that we've ever uh, been able to get to. And this company, Tagaratu, discovered it in their, you know, prospecting for oil. And there's something about that sort of herb that may be the food for the creature or something and that could be why it wound up hibernating where it did and why Tagaratu accidentally woke it up um, but that's all the way in Japan so did it like did it make its way all the way through from the Pacific up to around the continental US and off the coast of New York or as would be expanded upon in later installments in this trilogy are there more than one creature? In fact, in this movie, there was a theory that there's more than one creature attacking the city at once because since we never see, you know, we never get, like, news chopper perspective. This is all from being one of the people running around on the ground. Um, there, I remember even a friend of mine, a camera operator I used to hire all the time, this guy Joey Ips, he, he was like... Yeah, well, you know, they start out on this part of the city, and then all of a sudden they get to this other part of the city, and I just, I don't know how it would have gotten over there that quickly. I think there were two of them, and I'm like, dude, the monster is bigger than the buildings. <laughs> this thing can traipse its way across the city in minutes compared to what our folks that we're following would have to do. Um, one of the other things that was really interesting about this is... Uh, as they're making their way, so once their attempt to escape the city via the bridge fails, they um, have to stop for a minute, and Rob's phone is dead, and he's he's trying to get a hold of Beth. He suddenly has that super regret of, like, oh my god, major catastrophe, the apocalypse is happening, and I just told the woman I've been in love with since college to go F herself because she brought some other dude to my going away party. So he's trying to he's trying to figure out how to charge his phone his uh, or how he's going to be able to use his phone and we have a little bit of rioting beginning and these folks kind of break their way into a store that sells uh, cell phones for anyone who's not from the New York area there were all kinds of these like little stores that would sell like luggage and phones <laughs> you know what I mean it's like all kinds of randomness in the little bodega e type um, storefronts in New York. And when he goes into the store to get a battery for his phone, he stops and sees some news footage. This is another moment where we kind of get sort of partial glimpses of the creature. And one of the things it does show, though, in pretty, uh, pretty 
focused attention is the soldiers that are on the ground shooting at it. Uh, the ones that are close enough to it are noticing that there are these little smaller creatures like body lice almost that are falling off of the bigger one and they are scrambling around on the ground and attacking people and this becomes foreshadowing for something our 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 creature uh, <laughs> our heroes of the movie are going to encounter later when they wind up when they find themselves uh, using the subway tunnels to try to get from where they are to over to where Rob's girlfriend's apartment is to try to rescue her, affect some kind of rescue. I don't know, I'm suddenly, like, uh, maybe, maybe because I know what to look for, I feel like the moments that I'm seeing the creature in this as I'm watching it in the background here are a lot more um, revealing than I remember. But I remember being in the theater kind of like the whole time going like, I swear to God, I want to see more of this friggin' monster. And that would have been my only real complaint. I loved this movie. I really... I think at that time, before I was initially disappointed in the way that Lost ended, uh, which has been remedied since uh, due to a recent rewatch, uh, I was sort of desperate for any kind of expansion of the Lost universe. And I, I really did consider this movie to be a piece, or at least a, another piece of the Abrams universe, but I felt like, you know, much like Tarantino or Stephen King, everything they do is connected to everything else they do, you know? Um, and even though I wanted to see more of the creature, I am a little kind of not a huge fan of the design of the monster. They, they kind of, it doesn't follow a lot of, um, I don't know, I guess the best way I'll put it is it doesn't make much physical sense. The way its arms are articulated is, is odd. It has multiple sets of tentacles off on its chest that has a long tail that can kind of be whipped around and has a little bit of a mind of its own but really what it what is the sort of most disappointing thing uh, or at least most normal part of it actually strike that and reverse it is the face the face is kind of uh, probably the part they got the best and the sort of howling roar that it does through the movie really cool and that was uh, something that was very in the wheelhouse of Abrams. I mean, the smoke monster on Lost was mostly defined by the sounds it would make. I mean, when we're first introduced to the idea of a monster even being on the island, we're just seeing the trees being shaken and we're hearing the roar. And this is very much the metropolitan version of that in New York, where we're just seeing buildings collapse and hearing this kind of otherworldly sound, this otherworldly creature sound, but not seeing it so much. So in a lot of ways, it was very lost-ish. But so, you know, you've got this whole thing where there's this company that like basically unleashed this on the planet um, and isn't really uh, but again this is all stuff that you wouldn't know from the movie the movie itself is strictly following these group of four people trying to get from one side of the city to the other um, to try to rescue Rob's girlfriend and there's even parts where they're kind of like dude this is nuts and he goes yeah fine don't come with me I'll, I'll, I, I have to do this so I'm going and the, whether you guys come with me or not um, and then, I guess, spoiler alert for the way I'm going to talk about the rest of this, this is what my nephew couldn't stand about this movie, that, that even by the end of it, and probably something we should be keeping in mind the whole time, knowing that the tape we're watching, the very first part we saw at the beginning of this movie, was that this tape is property of the Department of Defense, which, unless that means they made their way out of the city and handed the tape to the Army... Um, <laughs> probably doesn't bode too well for the heroes that we're following in the movie. And ultimately, only one of them really kind of gets out. <laughs> like, they, it gets to the point where they find soldiers and, and they're told, go to this place and be here by 6 a.m. Those are the last choppers out of the city. You know, this attack is so intense. This creature is such a formidable foe that the government is... At one point, it said they're they're going to do the hammer down protocol. They're ready to like let this whole um, they're ready to let this whole area go, and uh, and Hud goes, "What do you mean, Midtown?" And he goes, "With him, no, Manhattan." Like, <laughs> imagine that. Like in the post 9/11 world, the government actually just going, "Look, New York is lost. The entire thing of New York, the entire island of Manhattan is gone." 
Um, hard to imagine, yet at the same time, weirdly realistic. You know, this movie really does kind of, um, especially for people who are from that area, I think, hit home in a little bit of a way that's probably too close. You know, much in the same way I remember when the um, Steven Spielberg, Tom Cruise, uh, War of the Worlds came out. There were sequences in that movie that were actually purposely designed to be uh, reminiscent of the people running away from the collapsing buildings in 9-11. And I had a colleague at the time who had to actually walk out of the, the movie because he was in the city. He was in 9-11. Like, he actually did. He was one of the people running away from the buildings collapsing. And um, the sequences in that movie were kind of triggering some PTSD from him. Um, so I could kind of see probably the same thing happening with this, only this has got so much more of this sort of Blair Witchy thing going on with the fact that it's a guy carrying the camera and running around with it that I think it kind of distracts a little bit from the sort of macro view there of uh, the city under siege, city being attacked kind of situation. Plus the fact that you, you know it's a monster. Um, mostly from the posters and from the promos. I, almost, I often wonder if it would be possible and how many movies has anyone really been able... I, in fact, I think the only one I could think of for myself was Lord of the Rings. Like, going in having only seen the poster and not really having any... having, I mean, slight familiarity with The Hobbit from uh, being a child. But I went into that completely cold and was blown away. I wonder if going into this, your first thought wouldn't be monster attacking the city. Um, but again, you know, there's certain elements that, you know, even the fact that they have to make trailers for movies, you have to expect that certain elements are spoiled a little bit before you get a chance to go in. And with this one, you know, you knew going in, it was going to be a movie about a monster attacking New York. So in any case, yeah. Um, kind of feels like there's not a super a lot to talk about other than the fact that you're left with more questions than answered which was a very uh, very lost like approach to storytelling for this movie um you you barely even get you know you get your towards the end of the movie you get like a, a really good direct view of the creature and he, but even that doesn't tell you much it doesn't tell you why this was happening it doesn't tell you what triggered this um jj abrams was quoted when people would ask him about what was really going on in the movie and he said i mean you know like uh, uh, they did a lot of studying of how animals behave in the wild and how if in the wild if a if a child of like a, a younger animal is separated from its mother it will panic and it'll run around and it'll cause havoc wherever it goes and so they said imagine the creature attacking new york was in that same panicked sense or if a mother is looking for its child it will also panic the glimpses you get of the monster throughout this movie not that they're not that you see it for long enough because they go by so fast you can't really compare but uh, the number of times I've watched this movie, I would say there's definitely some room there to think that it could have been multiple creatures attacking the city. I feel like it would be hard for them to not find each other. Um, but there are times where you're kind of like, does this one look a little bit bigger than last time we saw it? And that would account for the idea that maybe it's a mother in search of its child um, or a child looking for its mother. But um, that was sort of what he said we should have been kind of uh, taking from the sort of behaviors we would see. The little body lice that are the, the little parasitic creatures that are attached to the bigger one. No explanation for what they are or where they come from or what's going on. We don't even know if these things are, are, are creatures that originated on Earth and have been hibernating for centuries or came to Earth. Um, you know, there is a sense that... They do look like aliens to a, to a degree. Um, and then uh, there are some, you know, in fact, the, the YouTube video I watched, which I should be crediting the person who made it, but I can't remember who they are, and I apologize. I'm not going to look it up while I'm recording here. 
there are plenty. Just type in Cloverfield 20, 2008 on YouTube, and there'll be um, a whole bunch that come up and uh, say, you know, connecting the dots between all three movies. Because um, Tagaratu has appearances. Slusho appears in the next one, which is 10 Cloverfield Lane. Um, the bit, the one that really does a lot of explaining and also sets the stage for there to be another, like a proper sequel. Cause the other two movies, while they all are called Cloverfield in some way, this one's Cloverfield. The next one is 10 Cloverfield Lane. The third one is the Cloverfield Paradox, which is a Netflix original film. You can still watch it on Netflix. And it was announced after the Super Bowl. In, during the Super Bowl ads, I believe in 2018, because um, I think Cloverfield, 10 Cloverfield Lane came out in 2016. So yeah, you had a long time before there was an addition to the Cloverfield universe. For a long time, it was just Cloverfield by itself. And um, much like they did with this one, when the next one comes out, when 10 Cloverfield Lane comes out, they do an alternate reality game. That one required even more net sleuthing and like looking through websites for passwords and and you know stuff um and then came the the cloverfield paradox which is about a space station um doing a particle accelerator and they're they're doing it in space because it's the most powerful particle accelerator that humans have ever built and they were afraid of activating it while on the planet and so they decided it would be safer for them to do it in space and they wind up i think going into an alternate dimension as a result and there's a character in the beginning that is sort of doing a, a knowledge dump of uh theories of what this could do and that movie is supposed to be <laughs> This creature showing up in New York is supposed to be a result of them doing that experiment, you know, eight, nine, ten years later in space. Because uh, when you start playing with dimensions and stuff, it could ripple both into the past and to the future. I don't love that so much, but um, I don't feel like this movie needs that kind of excuse or... Uh, explanation i think the idea of a creature woke up at the bottom of the ocean and came out and got us works pretty well it seems like it's pretty standard territory for the godzilla like films but in any case yeah you know combining found footage and kaiju this is the only one in this style uh the other two movies are much more traditional uh produced movies tank Cloverfield lane um deals with uh a girl who is leaving her fiance and on the night that she's driving away she gets into a car accident and when she wakes up she is chained to the wall in a basement um, I'm trying to think of who is the Mary Elizabeth Winstead is the main character in that one John Goodman is the person whose bunker she is in and uh She's told that there is some kind of an attack happening and that the atmosphere is toxic and they, they can't leave. They have no idea how long they're going to be in there. And he also believes that they're, that the Earth is being attacked by extraterrestrials. So you can kind of see how with each installment in the series, they go further and further out into the realms of <laughs> Alien. Um, in fact, there was a there is a trailer that you can find still on YouTube now if you look up Cloverfield 2 trailer. And it's really the trailer for a video game called Prey. Uh, I think it's Prey 2, actually, that was uh, in development the year or two after this movie came out and wound up being canceled. But the way that the style in which that was filmed was much like this. It was like a found footage, but it was somebody on an airplane um filming you know he's sitting next to his girlfriend and they're also they're filming how it, while a uh, prisoner is being brought onto the plane and then mid-flight the sort of the <laughs> mid-flight the plane is attacked by a ufo but not just attacked like a portal is opened into the plane and creatures come out of it and the air marshals who were escorting the prisoner on the plane 
um, get into a little gun battle. It looked uh, stylistically, the, the color palette and everything, it, it was believable that it would have been the next installment in Cloverfield and l really had people um, thinking that the creature from this one was clearly an alien. Now, um, all of that said, <laughs> 10 Cloverfield Lane and Cloverfield Paradox are, you know, officially tied to these, to this film. And in doing my research and doing sort of an image search to build the visuals for the YouTube, I started coming across movie posters uh, advertising that one would be coming out in 2025 called Cloverfield Paris and featured, much like the posters for this movie, featured the Statue of Liberty with its head torn off and claw marks all over it indicating it got attacked by the creature first. They show the Eiffel Tower in ruins um, and, and I guess implying that another creature, like in this movie, is attacking Paris. Um, the creature did make its reappearance in Cloverfield Paradox. In fact, there there's sort of like a a back and forth between the the A story going on on the space station and the B story with one of the spouses from someone on the space station on Earth, and, and they keep hearing all these radio um, uh, broadcasts talking about giant creatures attacking cities, and you're kind of like, oh man, that's that's Cloverfield One. That's right. That's that's what's going on. And at the very end of that movie, we do see the creature again. So, was setting up like I thought back then, you know, 2018. We would, before now, have another one. So either it was either going to be coming out in May of 2024, which it would be a little weird for them to have not really advertised it by now. Uh, so it must have been April of 2025 that this uh, the posters all are calling it Cloverfield Paris. And so once I saw that, I started doing some Googling, and yes, it is official since 2022 that a proper direct sequel to the first Cloverfield is in development and uh, is slated to be coming out in the next couple of years here. So keep your eyes and ears peeled for that. I doubt you heard it here first, but you heard it here and it wasn't the worst. In fact, maybe it even made you burst. Like, what would happen if you got bit by one of the body lice that came off the giant monster? We see that happen to one of our characters in this movie, Lizzie Kaplan, who also was on an episode of Lost. Um, yeah, that part sucked. Oh my god. You know, there's there's times where you kind of you feel for the characters, uh, and it was the character who was sort of the semi-romantic interest of HUD, uh, T.J. Miller's character. It's funny, T.J. Miller, I saw him, uh, he was walking through the press area of Comic-Con New York, New York Comic-Con, in, I believe it was 2015 when I was there, and so when I saw him, I was just like, yo, T.J., and he kind of looked over and waved, and I was just like, oh, that's cool, it's a little moment for me with T.J. Miller, but what's really funny is um, the company I used to work for when I was still working in corporate video they made a series of educational videos to kind of teach children to try to do kind of children's programming to get people um, learning about like accounting and being smart with money at a, a young age and it, it's probably I, I don't know if I ever get a chance to really interview him I'm gonna ask him if he remembers doing this but I, I consider it to be like there's probably stuff people do at the beginning of their careers as actors that they're like this will never see the light of day and and I don't know if anything really ever happened with this project, but it was floating around the office when I was brand new there, when I first got hired in 2003. And it was one of the first things I had to do to make a DVD, like a whole bunch of DVD dubs of it to send around to different department heads. And there's T.J. Miller in, uh, in this video playing like a math detective. <laughs> and uh, it, it, he looked very very much like he wasn't that much younger than when this happened uh, if this was in 2008 five years ago five years between when i started working on my job and when this movie came out i think i also saw tj miller doing stand-up on comedy central once too so it's it's kind of interesting to me uh, being middle-aged now and remembering the sort of uh chronology 
of following certain names and then tj miller became huge you know uh with silicon valley on hbo and um i think he's even done he was in that movie uh what was it called the one where they have to go rescue their friend down in mexico i can't remember the name of it i'm sure someone out there knows what i'm talking about i should be googling this i should be on imdb right now i didn't expect this episode to be this long so <laughs> i'm gonna cut out now as chris mulkey from twin peaks is appearing on my screen um yeah they made it to the manhattan mall and that was sort of serving as like a uh a uh, a mobile HQ for the military <laughs> right when they decide yeah we're out of here <laughs> we can't this thing's winning we got to get the hell out of here um very cool movie uh I think it's aged rather well I in fact enjoy it more now than I think I did even when it first came out I liked it but I was always a little bit like I wanted more after, at the end of it. And so, you know, you got to remember the time where between 2008 and 2016, there wasn't any more. It was only whatever was still out there on the websites. It definitely did not feel like it gave us anything for Lost. Um, maybe when Super 8 came out, I don't even remember what year that was, but it was somewhere in the sort of aftermath of this. You felt like, oh, okay, that's kind of a little tongue in cheek extension there. Um, and 10 Cloverfield Lane, uh, the sort of, uh, backstory there is that it was a, a, a script that was floating around Hollywood for a while and it wasn't getting made and, um, J.J. Abrams liked it and said, hey, I'll buy it, but I'm going to make it part of the Cloverfield universe. We're going to change the title and we're going to add a few elements that'll sort of line it up into this thing that they're building a greater you know franchise and then um and then that was capped off with cloverfield paradox really kind of bringing it full circle um, but there's an alternate ending available if you watch the blu-ray on tank cloverfield lane that would have had an appearance of the cloverfield monster from this movie making an appearance at the end of that movie as well so i mean i like stuff like this i like world building i like world building that isn't, um, I mean, don't get me wrong, I was a huge fan of the Marvel Cinematic Universe when it was brand new. I thought the first Avengers was such a great culmination and a great um, sort of setting of the stage for what could be happening in that world. But, you know, there's it's no mystery that after Infinity War, the, it's been underwhelming and getting worse. Whereas movies like this, it was much more like they each stand on their own, but they have enough of these little sort of interconnecting Easter eggs for you to kind of like, oh, if you get it, you get it, and you get to feel special. And so that's what I'm trying to do is hand the keys over to any folks showing up at the water cooler today for a damn fine cup of coffee. And if you guys are out there, if there even is a damn fine cup of coffee company out there, please, for God's sake, let's get, let's talk, you know, call me up. I, I, I hawk you guys all the time and don't even know if you're real <laughs> in any case. Um, yeah, that's the whole idea. That's what these conversations were all about. This is why my boss used to ask me what was going on on Game of Thrones. I would hand the, I would hand over the keys. So I think that brings us to the end um, I can't do much more with this without just flat out telling you who lives, who dies, and what happens, and who laughs and who cries, and that's all up to you guys to find your way to buy into. So, without further ado, I guess it's time to head back to the desks, get back on the phones, get back doing whatever it is they pay you to do. This has been fun. Please, if you haven't already, smash the like and subscribe button, smash the bell icon. We get that algorithm working for us so that we can continue to work for you. And I will see you next time when we're going to talk about the movie. You've been listening to the Hollow Nine Network, bringing you the very best in fan made media. That's the word hollow, the number nine, I N E. Find the Hollow Nine Network on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. Rate and review us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you find your podcasts. Email us at hollow9podcast at gmail.com. Leave us your feedback. Join in the conversation and be a part of the action. Join in the fun. Hollow 9.